one thing he never talked money he was always talking of new ideas new challenges mm. new thoughts we have gone with people who are world players uh, welcome to a session with sayed babar ali sahab i am saima rana i took my mba from the lahore university of management sciences better known as lums currently i am a faculty member at lums assalamu alaikum sayed babar ali sahab today i would like to talk to you about your family businesses your flagship project of packages and about mr ruben rousing who had a very extraordinary role to play in your life and with packages i will start with some questions about your family businesses and your family businesses your family retained a controlling interest were you given complete control to run the businesses or your father sayed maratab ali sahab and your brothers sayed amjad ali sahab sayed afzal ali sahab and sayed wajid ali sahab also took interest in the business you know just to give you the background uh, our um, family business uh, after partition was trading primarily except that we had two small industrial uh, companies uh, that we we set up one in hyderabad uh, tree treasure plate company in collaboration with american safety razor corporation and the other was an oil mill in hyderabad sin which we acquired from uh, govind ram saxeria a very eminent uh, marwadi from from bombay uh, so um, and i was involved with uh, uh, on the peripheral side of uh, the on the supply chain in both these companies and uh, i don't to sweden you know partly sightseeing partly i was building a house in karachi and i wanted to furnish it and my architect said sweden is the place to go and in fact it was finland he said one should go and see light fittings and things like that so i was on my way to to finland and uh, you couldn't go to finland directly you had to go through sweden so i stopped over in sweden and i asked the people do we have any contacts in sweden they said yes there is this company called locker and rousing that has been writing to us for buying uh, packaging material for our razor blade factory so mm -hmm. i called on them and there and then i s told them that we would not buying from them because we they were too expensive but i then suggested on the spot why don't you put up a factory in pakistan and we'll join hands with you and that sort of triggered off the whole relationship with them and i then came back and told my father and my brothers uh, my father had more or less retired in business and my brothers uh, sayed amjad ali and sayed rajad rajad ali were they were active and uh, and they said well our hands are full we have no competence of the packaging industry and uh, if you can take this on your own and work with the swedes we will provide you with the resources so uh, they gave me totally a free hand and um, and i had that free hand for the first 25 years when i remained the managing director now mr ruben rousing who had founded auckland rousing the company that we partnered with who um, was a very practical pragmatic a good decision maker uh, he signed the collaboration and when ruben rousing heard about it he invited me to visit with him and he somehow he, he took a liking to me and uh, and there became a relationship between him and me and he was a person who um, was always a dreamer he did his after his uh, his uh, studies at the stockholm school of economics which was the premier education institution in sweden for economists he then went to colombia and got his masters in colombia came back and he saw there was an opportunity in introducing packaging into swedish industry which he saw in america mm -hmm. was evolving and uh, therefore he um, uh, he had no money at that time of his own he looked around and he found that there was a gentleman by the name of auckland who was a very uh, prosperous publisher 
So he went to him and he said, um, uh, I have an idea that you should get into packaging and he said, I know nothing about packaging. And uh, so he sort of gave Ruben Rousing the latitude and the resources to set up a packaging company. So that's why it's called Auckland and Rousing. And uh, so when I met with him, he was always thinking 10 years ahead, mm. thinking of new ideas, new uh, challenges. And uh, so I got a lot of uh, bit, you know, learning from him and, uh, and he was a mentor, almost a father figure. So it was, uh, and that relationship continued from, from 1956 till he died around 19, somewhere in the 80s. So good 30 years I had this wonderful opportunity to visit him. He came to Pakistan several times and he spent time here and one thing he never talked money. He was always talking of new ideas, new challenges, mm. new thoughts. And uh, that's what uh, I thought uh, was very great in him. And uh, so, I mean, as we go along, I can tell you more about him. But uh, he had a tremendous influence on me. Um, you, uh, you said that your uh, brothers had the handful with the business and Sayyid uh, Amjad Ali Sahib had joined the government. Uh, did your father uh, take this as a calculated decision uh, that this might help in the family businesses, his being in the government? No, 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 no. He was drafted into, into government business because the government wanted a person of his background. We, our business had nothing to do with the government at all. Okay. At all. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, when we put up uh, industry, we went like anybody else with an application to government and they evaluated it and um, it was a licensed regime so we had to stand in the queue and um, go and convince the government that um, this industry was needed so that and uh, i mean though my brother uh, continued to serve in in government in various capacities mm -hmm. there was no chance or no thought that we would ever dare ask him for anything uh, to 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 uh, to help our business at all this was there was a Chinese wall between us and him. So over, over the years, you had many successful joint ventures with international companies like Nestle, Coca-Cola, uh, Siemens, the Ford Motor Company. Was there a well thought through, uh, well thought through strategy and pattern in selecting these partnerships and diversifications or did they happen as and when? Well, I mean, the first, uh, uh, there was no joint venture. They, four people, when they realized Pakistan was an independent company, they came and uh, were looking for an opportunity to um, market their products here. So they went to the banks. Okay. That who are the people here that they should talk to because they wanted somebody who had the resources. And um, we were lucky enough that um, we, we had resources. So the banks recommended our name. So they came and met with us, interviewed us, found out and we got the Ford franchise, you know, uh, what they called direct dealers. Mm -hmm. They would sell us uh, cars, tractors, uh, trucks, uh, vans and we told them we know nothing about this thing. They said we'll give you a man who will run this business who has been a Ford uh, an employee. So he, he was seconded to us and uh, so he uh, ran the business and uh, we provided the resources and we also provided local talent, local uh, people we recruited. But we, it was running according to the Ford uh, protocol. But Nestle is another story. Then, uh, you know, I had served in the Fertilizer Corporation and after that I came back and I thought there was an opportunity in the agriculture sector. And meanwhile, you know, our associates, the Rousings, had sold off their mother company, mm -hmm. Auckland and Rousing, mm -hmm. and put all their resources into developing Tetra Pak, which was in packaging, but focusing on liquid packaging. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were very keen that we should introduce Tetra Pak in Pakistan. 
and uh, and primarily it was for packaging of milk so i thought the best thing would be to set up a milk processing plant and that would um, a have a diversification of our business here have another industry uh, and also introduce tetra pack so this is how we got into into tetra pack into milk and uh, introduced tetra pack and then nestle were looking at pakistan and they saw our company milk pack which was at that time the largest milk processing and marketing company they came to us and they said um, uh, we want, we have decided to come back to pakistan our first option is if you take us as a partner and second option is we want put up a green field project and i had been running this milk pack plant for 10 years and i realized that uh, there was no future in just buying liquid milk and processing it and selling it so this is how we came together with uh, with nestle uh, and i said um, Uh, we, I said, we control 80% of the shares. You can have 40%. I'll keep 40%. You run the company, and the price of the share is what is on the stock exchange today. Yeah. He had nearly fell out of his chair. That's true. I, I could have uh, demanded any price, but I thought this is going to be a long-term relationship. You don't try and um, to capitalize on 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 short-term basis. You know, the share at that time was 29 rupees. Mm -hmm. Today it is six thousand rupees, so it was not a bad decision. So, uh, by this, do you mean that uh, as opportunities came, you kept yeah, taking and, them on? Yeah, I mean Coca-Cola again. We never went to Coca-Cola. McKinsey uh, called me up one day and they said, uh, "I come, I want to come see you." And I said, uh, "I said when?" He said, "Tomorrow." I said, "Tomorrow I'll be in Islamabad." He said, "I'll come to Islamabad." So this was McKinsey man in in Delhi. He flew to Dubai and was in Islamabad the next day. And I said, "What can we do?" And he said, "There is an American company who wants uh, you as a partner." And I said, um, "Which company?" He said, "Coca-Cola." I said, "Why us?" He said, "McKinsey have done a study of all the joint ventures in Pakistan, and uh, your name is on the top." And uh, I said, "Well, I'd like to meet Coca-Cola and find out." So we, well, I went to their headquarters. Were in Singapore. I went to Singapore, and it it took a while because uh, they, uh, you know, they offered us a much bigger percentage than we could afford. And I said, we can't have it. So, you know, we can't. We, I said, we don't have that kind of money. And uh, they said, uh, suggest some other people, which I did. Two months later, they came back. We've been round, and you are the people we want. So we are a very small shareholder, but uh, surprisingly, it, it, they listened to me as if I was a majority shareholder. And uh, so it was they who came to us, and with Mitsubishi again, they came to us. They wanted to introduce uh, this bioaxial um, polypropylene film here, and they they were manufacturers of the equipment. And we said we know nothing about it. They so they said we'll come as as a partner. So our, you know, what has it evolved over the years is that we have gone with people who are world players. I mean, Coca-Cola in the cola business, they are big. In Nestle, there's nobody bigger mm -hmm. in the food business. Mitsubishi is a giant in Japan. Then um, there is a company called Sanofi, which is uh, a pharmaceutical company. Uh, they came out. Well, so it was not Sanofi. It was Hux. Hux was a chemical giant in Germany, yeah. and they came out in the 70s. And there again, they sought us out, and they went to uh, Ferguson's and asked Ferguson's who would they recommend. And Ferguson suggested our name, and so we became their major local partner, 25%, which we are today. And then Hux went through some. Reorganization and finally, it's now owned by Sanofi French. Okay. So we are 25% shareholders in Sanofi, and there again, Sanofi is one of the five or six large pharmaceutical companies in Europe, and maybe 10, number 10 in the world. So our whole idea idea is to have a partner who's a world player, 
because in Pakistan, if you are successful in any industry, everybody wants to rush into it. Yeah. And the only way you can stay ahead is by having a partner who's a world player because they have R&D, they'll keep on bringing new ideas, new brands, new products, and they'll keep you ahead. So uh, they will charge a technical fee, which is, is a normal thing in this world today. So that is how our group has uh, has developed and we have not embarked on anything on our own. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we feel that we should get a partner who will keep us ahead of the, of the curve. You've mentioned some of the factors that these international partners, uh, their research that they did before they came to do business with you. What were some of the factors other than what you've mentioned that you wanted big brands because they always made you uh, in the forefront of the industry. What were some other factors that you were looking at? You know, we, you know if there's a world cup, if it is a world player, they have to be ethical. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to check on their on their credentials. The only thing that um, that uh, could go wrong is the chemistry between the individuals. You can't have two different yardsticks. We've never had a divorce. We've had separations. There was a company called JNP Coats. Uh, they were the largest thread manufacturers in the world at one time. And they had they wanted to set up a company in Pakistan and they came to us through the banks. We were their 40% shareholders. Then JNP Coats in, in, in England went through changes. It was taken over by venture capitalists and this and that. And then it was finally bought by some Australian company and they had no interest in, in Pakistan and we said and, and we, we it took half an hour to to, to um, sign up a separation arrangement. There was no divorce, there was no going to court, there was no lawyers. I said put a value on the shares and you take them over. And there was a similar thing which happened with Bayer mm -hmm. uh, when uh, Hearst split up, they split up three ways. One was a chemical company which was taken over by Clarient, which is a Swiss company. Their um, uh, crop science company, mm -hmm. pesticide and others were taken over by Bayer. So I became a 25% shareholder of Bayer Crop Science. And we worked well for a while and then um, they said we already have a company in Pakistan in pharmaceuticals and we want to combine these companies and you are with Sanofi, can we buy you out? I said, sure. <laughs> and there again, I said, put the two accountants together. They came with the price and I said, this is the price. That's good. Uh, so you had various interactions with uh, many multinational companies. One of uh, significant mention is uh, with Levers in England. And uh, there you say you saw uh, uh, the transformation of a colonial imperial company in a modern, into a modern enlightened one. Um, can you share your views on that? How, how yeah, did yeah. You see I mean, you know, we that was the first joint venture we had with uh, Levers because you know our business in India was related to the British Army, and we were uh, they are very large customers. We used to buy Levers products by the train load, not by the wagon load, Truck load yeah. by the train load because we were catering to a few hundred thousands British uh, soldiers in India. So they knew us and when Pakistan came, uh, they wanted a local partner. We said uh, we already had permission to set up an oil mill and a soap factory in, in Bahawalpur. And uh, we, they, we said we have a permission, we gave them the permission and that's how we became partners. And at that time it was an imperial company. They had, they had a three, they put up three companies. Mm -hmm. One was an oil man, a vegetable oil company, one was a soap manufacturing company and the other was a marketing company. Mm -hmm. So the, we were only partners in their manufacturing companies but not in the marketing company. Okay. Till about 10 years later, one of their directors came out, this is, he said, this is rubbish. You know, we were getting 2 or 3 percent on manufacturing profit and the profit was directly made by the marketing company. So then it became Lever Brothers Pakistan and we and I my brothers, you know, as they were very busy, they put me on the board. 
and I remain a director of levels for 50 years, 5-0, which I think is a record for any company any anywhere. And uh, then, of course, uh, there comes a time that um, they wanted to um, uh, they wanted to um, privatize the company, and so we it was on the stock exchange. So we sold our shares to levers. Uh, so it was a very friendly uh, exit, mm -hmm. but I could see the mentality of these multinational companies from an imperial to a competitive country. Yeah. So why don't we see nowadays many uh, international partnerships like these in our country in the last few decades? Why haven't we seen many international Well, you asked me those people because we, you know, I mean, we, we, we don't want to go into every business, mm -hmm. but we only want to go into businesses which are in, uh, in rhythm or in uh, leverage with what we are doing already. And um, there are a number of uh, successful joint ventures today, but uh, I, I'm not aware of too many. Uh, you seem to have an extraordinary observation skills and attention to detail. Uh, uh, one such exam extraordinary example is that uh, when you were observing Mr. Hanitsky, who was a Russian who came to Karachi to buy uh, raw cotton. cotton. And you say that this man, um, that he was very, Mr. Hanitsky was very organized uh -huh. and he was working, uh, working uh, he was through his suitcase and that he had a very systematic way of his telexes. Um, how did he operate and what did you learn from him? Well, I know it, was tele it was cables in those days, no telexes. His name was Kanitsky. Mm -hmm. No, I got to know him very well because uh, he was a very interesting individual. Uh, and uh, one man who was selling uh, everything that Russia wanted to sell Pakistan and he was buying cotton. The cotton was the main crop that he was buying from here, was the only crop. And um, he showed me a very interesting system. The first um, letter on the telegram was the his number, you know, he would say it said ninth. They said, okay. this is my ninth yeah. cable to you. Yeah. With a slash number 12 okay. that I've received your number 12 cable. Okay. So they would know that if there is anything missing, you know, just by that thing, he, and I, I noticed it and I said, this is the simplest way to find out whether something's missing, whether there was anything missing in the two things. And so I became very good friends with him. And then he, um, you know, in 1952, as Russia um, invited people from around the world who were trading with them. And uh, so my name was also on that list. I happened to be in America when this invitation came. So I, uh, my brother called me up in America and he said, your friends want you to, to visit their country. You know, the telephones were tapped in those days. He didn't want to mention the word Russia or anything like that. So I said, where do I get the visa? He said, you go to London. The London embassy has been informed of your visa. So I flew back from New York to, to London and went to the Russian embassy and got my visa and went to Moscow. I had a wonderful time. I was there for two weeks. There were about 15 people from Pakistan okay. who were there for this conference. And in all, there were about maybe two, three hundred people from around the world. And it was a very wonderful experience. All came out of that friendship with Kanitsky. With Kanitsky, yeah. Um, uh, so in your family businesses, uh, with the responsibility comes accountability. Uh, so in times of disappointment, what were the reactions of your family? Can no. you share some examples? No, no, nobody asked any questions. I mean, my my brothers never said, I mean, you know, in the cotton trade, they, you, you, you win and you lose. And something didn't go the right way. But it, those losses were in, 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 in hundreds of thousands of rupees. They were not in crores. So these were things that were manageable. So, no, there was no, there was no rancor in the family. Okay. I mean, the whole idea was that work hard and, and, and make sure that uh, you do what you're expected of you. 
so did that did that ease your uh, you ease your path to make decisions to get into yeah, 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 nobody ever interfered i mean what responsibility i had packages i had 200% authority i had been you know i initially they put money into it and then i was making money every year so there was nothing to to feel uh, to feel uh, you know disappointed about it so uh, moving on from here to your flag flagship packages um after 1947 there were no printed uh, packaging facility in pakistan and uh, most of the requirements of packaging were being met through by imports including those of your uh, razor blades so how did you come up with this idea of signing a joint venture with well, them? i told you when i was in sweden i asked them i said instead of selling packaging to me why didn't we come up and and set up a factory and manufacture packaging and sell it to all your customers their main customers were unilever and pakistan tobacco company yeah because they were large consumers of packaging material so that was not only taking care of your own needs no, but no, of the country no, no, as well no no i mean our own needs were maybe 5% 95% were other customers so in a matter of just uh, two days in 1954 you signed the joint venture with akalan on uh, for packages um you were very young maybe yeah. around 28 years of age yeah. um so uh, uh, what give you so much confidence to sign deals like these other than the confidence that your family was well giving? i mean i went to the lawyer is consulted with lawyers and it wasn't just uh, because i have always believed in listening to others to take any advice from others i went to a, uh, the british american tobacco company in in london and before i signed up with dr rousing i said you are buying from them is it a good company that i should be partner with and they said yes so you have to look around and see what kind of people that you are uh, going to collaborate with and what kind of standing do they have in uh, among their large customers So this is something that uh, I've always sort of relied on, on checking up on the credentials of people that we work with. Mm -hmm. uh, the government uh, did uh, facilitate uh, in setting up of Packages Limited. Is, is the government still helping uh, inventors like these in the industry today? Well, I mean, the only uh, that time there was no industry in Lahore at all. Yeah. And we uh, were looking around for prop uh, for uh, for land. and uh, there was this land where we had to land located this was barren land uh, which had no use so we went to government and we said we'd like to lease this land mm -hmm. and we that that land was leased because there was no other bidder for it there was no other but nobody else wanted any that land and uh, so we took that land and that's and we've been paying lease money from that ever since we took it over We've talked about uh, Mr. Ruben Rousings briefly in the beginning of our interview. I would like you to recall your first meeting with this man, who later became like a father to you. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, he was in his early 60s, and you were maybe 28 years of age. So, how do you re recollect that first meeting? No, no. I mean, the meeting was. I was actually meeting somebody who was a giant in his own uh, country and in, in his own business, and. Uh, then uh, you know uh, he he came out to pakistan a year or two years later and we we developed a kind of a the right kind of communication and and then this thing and then he insisted that i visit him he had a large farm in south sweden lovely beautiful farm uh, it was about 2000 acres uh, and he lived on that farm and uh, i used to visit him and he used to drive me around in in his small car and and talk about things and he was i tell you i mean give you the vision of this man he said you know this since he brought that land he was very keen to plant forest so he had uh, the soil kind of tested borings done to 8 or 10 feet down Uh, and got the nutrients in the soil evaluated and uh, gave that problem to the to the forestry people he said tell me which tree would be most suitable to be planted here 
and uh, they came up with the other idea that it should be oak. Mm -hmm. And he looked around and there was not a single oak tree. So he said there must be a reason for it. We gave that problem to the historian. Tell me why there is no oak growing on my land. And they came up with this with the explanation that under the Swedish law, going back thousand years, all oak belonged to the king of Sweden because it was used for the Swedish Navy yeah, to making ships. And he said they found out that if any farmer had an oak sapling growing, he would take it out because it meant that the government people would, inspectors would come, like the income tax officers mm -hmm. are here, <laughs> to inspect whether you're looking after the tree. So he had to feed the inspector also and look after the tree. So they pulled the tree out. So then he, he told me, he said, I have decided to plant oak. And the earliest I can harvest this oak is 70 years, which I, he said, none of my children will benefit, but maybe my grandchildren will. So that is the kind of vision he had. Yeah. Wonderful person. Another visionary uh, quote that he uh, told you was that hard work has never killed anyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so, what are uh, what are his uh, professional advice that you still work by? Yeah, yeah. His first advice to me was trust your people. He said, if you can't trust your employees, get out of business because business is on trust basis and this is what I've done all my life and I can tell you 99% of the people have never let me down. The one that may have let you down, you couldn't care less. Um, during the 1965 war with India, uh, Mr. Rubin Rousing's concern for your wife and children while they were stranded in Europe sets for a very beautiful example. Can you share that event? Yeah, yeah. He found out that Parveen and, and my children were in Paris. So he immediately called them up. He said, you come over and you have no right to be in Paris. So he called them up and he looked after them till the war was over. And uh, I was here. I was living in this house mm -hmm. all by myself and used to go to work. So when the war was over, they came back and um, he put both my son and my daughter in a Swedish school to, they to go out with his uh, grandchildren. No, it was a, it, it was like a family to us and they still have been. Yeah. How did Mr. Rousing's son, Mr. Gard and Mr. Hans continue this legacy of friendship? Yeah, they, they continued. They were both very close friends. Very close friends. Gard, um, you, you know, Ruben Rousing was a director of packages. He became chairman of packages, uh, Ruben Rousing, after my father passed away. Then after 10 years, he said um, that he was retiring from all his companies. Then he put his son, guard, the eldest son, he, be, he became a director. And then uh, Hans, uh, his younger son became the head of the company mm -hmm. because he found out that his younger son was brighter than the older, older one. one. The older one was also very intelligent, very, but his heart was not in the business. He was more of a scientist. He was a archeologist. And, uh, and had a very fine brain and a good writer and his wife, they both were PhDs. So how does this transition continue of the Rousings and the Ali family since you, uh, since even today they are the single they're largest really Now you see the, the two brothers split up. So the younger brother sold his shares to the elder brother and the elder brother's children now are the owners of Tetra Pak and they became one of the richest people in the world, um, you know, not among the first 20 in those days before this new, you know, the Googles and the others came in, but they, they were billionaires in, in their own right. So, but our relationship uh, and with the, with the younger generation, they decided that the, we had a joint venture here, Tetra Pak. They decided that they wanted to set up a larger company here, which they wanted to own themselves. And we said, fine. So they paid us a good price, but they insisted that I stay on as a small shareholder and the chairman of the company. And we are very happy to do that. But we are, we are probably the only family in the world, which is friendly with both the families. Both the families.
staying on with our discussion on uh, Ruben Rousing. I would like to know if you are a Ruben Rousing for anyone. Ah, no, he was too great a man. No, he was. You uh, must be, sir. <laughs> no, no, I, I have a lot of respect for him. He was a great builder. He was a great thinker. But I learned a hell of a lot from him. And uh, no, it's something. Do that, you try to have the same kind of relationship that he had with you, with people who? Well, I mean, I'm. Uh, my door is open. Anybody who wants to come and uh, see me, spend time with me, I'm always available. I've never told anybody that I have no time for you. So this is the least I can do. And. Uh, Quite a few people, not only here but abroad, uh, they come and meet me and spend time. No, it's, a, it's been a very rewarding journey for me. It looks like it. It's a beautiful relationship with uh, Mr. Ruben Rousing. Moving back to packages, you made uh, joint ventures with many international companies by drawing them into Pakistan and then um, uh, later reversed that and set up uh, joint ventures of packages with other uh, international companies. Can you tell us more about that? Well, I mean, package itself was a joint venture with Auto Rousing yeah. and then when they sold off Auckland Browsing, then we became uh, we became uh, shareholders. Uh, share. Stora is a big company in, in Sweden, belonging to the Wallenberg Group. They became shareholders of packages because they bought Auckland Browsing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they are still our shareholders. It's a small shareholding, but they are very important people. Even Tetra Pak is also a, it, it has a token shareholding in packages. Then packages. Um, entered into joint ventures with uh, with Mitsubishi for setting up a tripack a company packages entered into a into a joint venture with uh, with DIC uh, they bought over a French company which belonged to to Total the oil company called the ink company was called Laurel Liu. Mm -hmm. so Laurel Liu was our partners in tet in, in the ink company and because DIC bought Laurel Liu, they became our partners with us. Then, um, about four years ago, there's a Swiss company who are um, called Omia. They are the largest um, uh, company in uh, in uh, calcium carbonate. Okay. Uh, calcium carbonate is something that goes into paints into into your aspirin that you eat. Okay. You know, from that, it's, it's such a... They came to us, they said they are not in Pakistan and they have heard from Nestle, and this is a Swiss company. So we have a 50-50 joint venture with them, which started three years ago. And it's, it's doing well. And it's all based on local raw material, which is marble coming from, north, from, uh, from the frontier and the mm -hmm. northern areas. So it's a company. So we, our door is open. We are always looking for new ideas, but it has to be somebody who will keep us ahead. Okay. So at packages, uh, uh, you had this policy of um, hiring fresh talent yeah, yeah. Uh, on merit, and you believed that you necessarily didn't need people with experience. Along with that, there were some uh, labor policies that kept your employees extremely well taken care of. Uh, so, what are uh, what is this merit that we are talking about? Uh, and merit is that he should be able to read, write, speak. You know that is what uh, and and should be. You know, should if he's an engineer, then he should know something about engineering, because he's forgotten ninety percent of what he's read at the university anyhow. Yeah. So we want to know if he's keen to learn. And uh, so, and we find that that is the best way to groom people. You train them up uh, uh, the way that you want them to work. Not everybody stays with us. Of the 10 people we hire, after 10 years, we have probably left with three. But those three stay with us for the lifetime. And I would say in, in our group, in the blue collar workers, it's 100% this is the first job anybody has ever had. In the white collar worker, 90% of the people, this is the first job they've ever had. So there is this long-term relationship. They become a part of the family. They are not employees. And uh, so we try and pay them better than their market value. Uh, nobody's ever been, ever been sacked for making a mistake. But if they steal a rupee, they are out. 
So there is no, there is no tolerance on ethics. We couldn't care less what religion he belongs to. If he has any faith, if he's agnostic, that's his problem. We want somebody who is a good person. Uh, so were these uh, these policies instituted in your other uh, ventures yes, yes, also? Yes, yes, everywhere. Same. Now we we now move people diagonally from one company to the other because you know, there comes a time where a person is stuck in a job. Yeah. And he's ta talented, and there is no there is no room for him to grow in that company. So we move him to another working company, or we if we are setting up a new company, we move him there. So, so, do you think these policies have also shaped the policies in uh, industries other than yours, generally in the in the I would country? say so. I would say so. I would say. I mean, we don't. I mean, we don't talk about it, but people know about it. No, we. Uh, I mean, we have a union in all these companies. We have, you know, regular negotiations with the union. There are tough negotiations, but uh, uh, I was very upset when we had the first union. And I went to Sweden and I asked Mr. Holger Crawford, you know, the person yeah. who was managing Akhundas. He said, "You can't talk to five thousand people yourself. You have to have somebody who represents them." Mm -hmm. So that was quite an eye opener. Uh, so for a very long time, uh, Packages has been an industry leader. Uh, what are some of the strengths that uh, made it so? Well, we, we we keep on reinvesting, not only in peop in, in 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 equipment, in in people. We send them abroad. We work with the manufacturers of equipment. We work with our customers because people like Unilever, Nestle, PNG, they are big buyers of packaging material in the world, and they have new ideas as to what the packaging is going to look like five years from now. What are the new materials? So we work with them, and we send our people to work with our customers, so that we are ahead of our our competition and their needs. So while surely today you must look upon your very diverse businesses with quite satisfaction, how do you see them in the coming years? And are we looking at some new ventures coming? Well, if there's something new, which you know, we don't want to go into me to business. If somebody is in textiles, good luck to him. We don't want to be in textiles. We want to be in something which nobody else has in Pakistan, and where we could link up with somebody who can bring some new product which is needed in the country, not not for fashion, but it's needed and it's needed on a large scale. And also, we want to go into industry which requires. A large investment, so that investment is a barrier, not a big barrier, but the biggest barrier is technology, and uh, and having a partner who is a world player. So, where do you see some of the ventures that you already have in the future? Well, I mean, if they keep on growing, if they don't keep on growing, they'll die. So, you know, हमेशा की तो खुदा की जात को है. So you have to be prepared that some things will thrive, some things will not thrive, and you have to live with it. Uh, you say that Mr. Ruben Rousing came to Lahore many times and stayed with you. I would like to know how did he spend his days here, and you also drove him to the Khyber Pass. If uh, yeah, yeah, he was uh, he was very inquisitive. Uh, he was always trying to ask questions. Uh, I took him to Rinala to to Mitchell's fruit farm where my sister lived, and he fell in love with that place. And uh, he, um, my my sister and my brother-in-law Mohsen took him to Rinala Stead Farm, who was uh, in their in their neighborhood. They were breeding horses, so he wanted to see that. And would you believe it? He came back and he said, "I want to start breeding horses in Sweden." And uh, so I put him in touch with um, one of the uh, bloodstock agents through whom he could buy horses and the horses for breeding from England. He started this nucleus of the stud farm, and he put his eldest grandchild, Kirsten Rousing, to look after that. And she today runs one of the most successful studs in England, wow. called Landwades. Of course, Kirsten would never admit that uh, the origin of the thought came, came from, from Pakistan Rinala. and from Rinala and by her grandfather. 
she thinks it's her creation and her she's done a fantastic job uh, and built it up and uh, it's one of the most successful stud farms in england so this is how things catch on and he was ever inquisitive about these things how was he as a companion when you were driving him through yeah he uh, had with him he had uh, once he brought to mr um, olin uh, he was a nobel laureate in, in economics and uh, so he brought him along to see what pakistan was like and what he was doing here and uh, the next time he brought uh, another very dear friend of his Henning Thronerhorst who was uh, owner of Marabu chocolate in Sweden he brought him along and uh, so he was always you know having friends that he could spar with mentally and keep on discovering new ideas and new thoughts you know way back in uh, in 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 the 60s he told me he said he, he, the, there was a, an economist not only in but somebody else was in pakistan on behalf of united nations and he said you better tell your people in government that they have to be careful about population growth because this economist friend of mine tells me that pakistan has more children than they can afford and he warned us in 1960 when the population of west pakistan was 40 million and now it is 220 million so what are some of um, words that you remember by heart like these you know ones? i mean these things you know i mean you you don't have a kind of sort of make a half is of yourself of what he said but certain things stick with you yeah and uh, he was very particular about exercise walking uh, uh, and uh, and food he he never ate red meat he was always eating white meat either chicken or fish and uh, so this is something that um, one learned from him that food was very important uh, always and eat less of food mhm mm when i you know it was one of his i was driving with him in his farm and i said i said i'll never get to your age he was maybe 80 at that time i was 40 he said why i said because i work harder than you do i could take that liberty with him he said hard work has never killed anybody you will die because of women drink or food not hard work, hard work. i have two questions uh, if you have sure that, sure i have two ahead. questions about packages which are not related to the business but i think the one question is about the rose garden at packages where yeah, you have over yeah. 300 species yeah, of yeah, uh, yeah, roses yeah, yeah. and people in lahore had marked it on their calendars when you used to have your yeah, annual rose exhibition garden. Yeah. so uh, would you like to tell us about this collection yeah this is very interesting because i was driving I, you know i used to go to sweden every summer and it's their factory was in a place called lone which is in the south near malmo i was driving to mr thronholz factory in a place called buv he had a factory at that time where he was making frozen food okay so i he want ruben rousing wanted me to see this factory which was eventually bought over by it was called findus it was bought over by nestle and then nestle sold it to unilever so on the way i saw acres of roses and this gentleman who was driving me i said stop here i want to see this so i went into a into a small shack and uh, there was a lady sitting there and i said uh, uh, can i see the manager she said i'm the manager i said uh, i'm setting up a factory in lahore and i want to start a rose garden there can you help me do that she said sure so for the first 5 years we used to get 20 different varieties of roses from her for planting in our rose garden and she gave me instructions as to how you prepare the beds and all that so this is the origin and then after the 5th year she said i've run out of varieties you better go to germany and there's a company called cordis in germany which are the leading rose growers in europe okay. and you start buying roses from there so we i went to cordis they are the outside hamburg 
and for the next 20 years we used to bring 10 new varieties from them. So that's how we built up this thing. And we used to give away about 5,000 bushes every year to anybody who wanted roses. So right from the president's house to the prime minister's house to the municipalities to Mr. Bhutto's house in Darkana. You talk about that. At so the these roses are, are, are spread all over the country and now of course the local nurseries have caught up. They have much better varieties and they have much better knowledge. But we've maintained those roses. In the new site also? Yes, 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 we have, but not the same variety of so, that we have here because it takes a lot of time. It lot, takes a lot of care. You know, a, rose, a plant is like a baby. And uh, you can only concentrate on the manufacturing or the, on roses. At one time, people thought packages was growing roses and nothing else. So, uh, Babar Sahib, how many varieties of roses and bushes would you have at packages? Well, at I mean, this time? you know, varieties, is, we have from perhaps more than 300 varieties and each variety has maybe 6 to 10 bushes. So, I would say 300 multiplied by 6 would be over 3000 different plants of, rush, of, of roses. Uh, and it, it takes, they require a lot of care. You know, the ground gets rose sick also so you have every 10 years you have, have to break. take away the you know put them in, into um, a fresh bed and uh, so that to keep them uh, and, and and have a new uh, new generation of the same variety so you say that um, uh, these things require a lot of time and attention so at packages other than the rose garden there was a lot of literary work going on also yeah yeah, yeah. you but had um, uh, Sayyid Zulfiqar Ali Shah working on out of print books of Amir Khusro and Saadi and you had Dr. Muhammad Iqbal working on calligraphy and writing competitions then you talk about Dr. Nazir Ahmed scholaring the works of Sufi poets uh, and not to mention um, uh, of course Sir Ghulam Mustafa Tabassum so these these people had the physical space at packages yeah, yeah, and yeah. you used to spend a lot of time yes, with yes. them. Yes, yes, they had an office two, day, two doors away from me. Yeah. And it was really such a, a, a rewarding uh, association. Zulfiqar so, was my own tutor at Aitzen yeah. College. He became principal and when he left Aitzen College, I didn't want him to stay at home. I said, my, and that very year my father had passed away. Okay. So I said, um, I said, Shah Saab, come over to packages because we need an elder person to guide us. So he was there till, till he passed away. And then the same thing happened with Dr. Nazir Ahmed. Yeah. I found, I got to know Dr. Nazir Ahmed through one of my teachers at Aitzen College, Mr. Kernan. He was my mentor at Aitzen College. Okay. And uh, he and Dr. Nazir were at Cambridge together. Uh, so I, he introduced me to Dr. Nazir and when Dr. Nazir, Nazir retired from government, I asked him, I said, what are you doing? He said, nothing. I said, come over. And I said, what do you want to do? He said, I want to do this, write a book, you know, write a, do research on these Sufi poets. And I said, we'll provide you all the facilities. You come and do that. So he produced four excellent books. works, which uh, you know, our, our Sufi Tabassum was my teacher at Government College and when he retired, he, he didn't move to us, but he used to come and visit us and he did a lot of work for us and it was, it was a treat to spend time with him. He was such a giant in the literary world. So we were very lucky to have interacted with these giants of education and literature uh, and they got me interested in, in local Punjabi literature, in, in Persian literature, in Urdu literature, so, so I've been very lucky. Are things like these happening at packages today? No, because um, uh, my daughter is literary, she's interested, not she's my son. She's very interested in poetry. Yeah, but, uh, well, everybody can't do everything. That's true. So. Thank you so much. Okay, wonderful talking yeah. to you. I hope Same you... Here. I didn't. No, you, I didn't give you any time to talk. I, did I didn't want to talk. It was not my floor. Okay. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. Thank you so much. It was a parliament, mock parliament, where half the students, after the age of say twelve or thirteen, were made members of the parliament. When food was being served, 
this German waiter, you know, was serving me food and his, his eyes was on the meat that he was serving me and I couldn't eat.